Okay. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Franz Hartman. I'm with the Municipal Leaders for Stronger Communities. We are a network of community leaders who want to provide a space for municipal leaders uh, and uh, community members to access experts, knowledge and resources to help build stronger communities. I want to first begin with a land acknowledgement. I acknowledge that the land uh, I am on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. I also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. These are lands that were meant to be shared with nature and in a way that honors the life that we have been given. The history of this land clearly demonstrates that we have not lived up to this, uh, to this intention or promise. To have hope for future generations, to have a sustainable world for them, we must recognize the value in each other, reconcile for past tragedies and ensure compassionate care and concern for all. Further, we must recognize that the various components of our ecosystem, the air, land, water, flora, and fauna, are all interdependent and need to work in harmony. The only way forward is together. Welcome to our fourth webinar, Creating Housing Solutions Amidst Planning Chaos. Uh, you can view our first three uh, webinars at the EcoSpark uh, YouTube channel. I'll put a link to that in the chat function shortly. And a special thanks to EcoSpark for partnering with us on these series. Now to a quick overview of what to expect uh, for the next hour. We're starting with a panel discussion followed by a Q&A, which will likely take us to about five o'clock uh, or so. Then there will be an after discussion uh, for those who want to stay on and continue talking. Uh, before we start with the panel discussion, I'd like to spend just a moment finding out a bit about each other, about who we are. Um, and I'm going to turn off my screen share for now and uh, ask Margaret to uh, go ahead with the first poll. Pull us up. What best describes you? Elected official, municipal employee, member of the public? If you're all three, pick the one you like best. Okay, we have almost everybody, so I'm just going to put up the results here. So, as you can see, uh, the majority are either are member of the public, but closely followed by elected officials. So, between officials and municipal employees, we're over 50%. Great. Thank you very much. Now I'd actually like to turn things over to Margaret Prophet, uh, our panel moderator. Margaret is the executive director of the Simcoe County Greenbelt Coalition and is a respected community leader who understands the importance of connecting and working with municipal leaders in Simcoe County to build stronger communities. Margaret, all yours. Thanks, Franz. Uh, hi, everybody. As, as Franz said, I've uh, this has been our fourth um, webinar in this series, and that's been really interesting. Uh, we've had several housing discussions, just so everybody knows these sessions all get recorded and they all get shared. Um, so if you're worried about that, don't worry. Um, we're also going to be holding an after space, which is a little bit just uh, more casual for everybody. If you haven't had a chance to ask a question, if you'd like to make a comment, um, that's the time that I'll be hosting that uh, for about 10, 15 minutes afterwards. So you're also welcome to stay on for that, but of course, leave when you have to. Before we get started, I'm going to start with the uh, panelists. And since Karen, your camera's on, I'm assuming Victor is, is uh, stepped away for a second. So I'm gonna start with Karen Chappelle, who is the director of the School of Cities and professor in the Department of Geography and Planning at the University of Toronto. She studies inequalities in the planning, development, and governance of cities and regions throughout the Americas. Her recent book include her recent books include Planning Sustainable Cities and Regions Towards More Equitable Development and Transit-Oriented Displacement or Community Dividends, Understanding the Effects of Smarter Growth on Communities. She is also a professor emerita of city and regional planning at the University of California, Berkeley. Thank you, Karen. I'm looking forward to digging into those books. Um, 
next we have Victor Doyle from, 19, from 1988 to 2017. Victor held a variety of senior positions in the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, developing and overseeing implementation of provincial land use policies. This involved overseeing housing and land supply research, developing affordable housing policies under the provincial policy statement and growth plan, and leading legislative initiatives, including Ontario's inclusionary zoning and additional unit framework under the Planning Act. And one of Victor's roles was to be involved in regional planning in Simcoe County uh, for the province. So he knows our neck of the woods uh, pretty, pretty well. Uh, just want to check, Victor, are you there before we start with questions? I am here, Margaret, but uh, my camera says the host won't let, <laughs> has stopped my video. So I'm not sure. Okay. I will change that. Now can you, there you go. There you are. Yay. Yay, you are here. You're not just a, an avatar. All right. I pre-recorded so. my remarks. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, just to get everybody started, a little bit of a warm-up question. We're going to kind of start high level. Obviously, you both have decades of experience creating housing policy for governments here in Ontario and, of course, in the U.S. Let's first bring it back to what do you make? You, you have lots of cross-jurisdictional uh, experience. What do you make of the province's approach to dealing with the many housing shortages we face in Ontario? And I'll throw it to you, Victor, first, since since you were a part of the provincial government for a while of the bureaucracy, and then um, Karen, if you have additional comments afterwards. Well, thanks, Margaret. Good afternoon, everyone. Franz, maybe you can just put up that map to start. You know, the, the government has been leaning on this, I would call rhetoric that we're short of land and that that's the key to our housing supply issues. And while we, we know we need more housing to be constructed because we're a really rapidly growing region and province, um, really the government is blaming municipal red tape and citizen nimbyism, not in my backyard, as two of its key obstacles, what it says is two of the key obstacles to allowing housing supply to be built. But the fact of the matter is we have been planning for millions and millions of people in the region and the province as a whole, but I'm focusing on the greater Golden Horseshoe. And, you know, stripping away our land use planning and environmental protection and agricultural protection frameworks really has nothing to do with increasing housing construction. And just quickly on the supply side, there's about 200,000 acres of land that's already been approved for urbanization, including housing throughout the Golden Horseshoe. Uh, the light pink on the on the map is areas that have already been built up in our cities and towns, and the darker pink is land that's hasn't yet been built on. And there's been some recent research that looked at all the municipal reports that have just been done and concluded there's about two million units planned on that land that is yet to be developed and within our currently built up areas. The regional planning commissioners followed that up in March by saying there's 1.3 million of those 2 million units already under construction, approved or applied for. And so if we go to the next map, uh, Franz, This is just a blow up of the greater Toronto area in Hamilton, where you can see uh, all that dark purple and pink land that's been approved for urbanization, but is not yet built on. So we've got lots of housing planned and in the pipeline on all these lands we've added uh, in the past. And the minister just added another 50 to 60,000 acres just in the greater Toronto and Hamilton Hamilton area last fall. So the notion that we're short of land and, and housing to go on that land is simply not accurate. 
And so we need to look at other things that are precluding the construction of housing on the region, in the region. And I think that the government's really, it might have, might have diagnosed supply as a, a big part of the issue, but it's uh, the prescription for its remedy is not just in adding more land for urbanization and converting more farmland. So I just wanted to set that context because there's a lot of misinformation floating around about that. And we'll talk more about actually spurring housing construction and things municipalities can do as we move forward. But I'll, I'll flip it to Karen now, see if she's got additional comments. Yeah, no worries. What, can I just, just summarize there that that Victor, your your feeling about the province's approach is just kind of pointed in the wrong direction. Is that to summarize quickly? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Drawn out. Yes. Karen, throw it to you. What do you think about the the approach that's being undertaken of of building your way out of this crisis? Well, oh, so just in the big picture, yeah. If uh, starting the the idea that supply will uh, solve all the affordability problems is um, is very naive, and we haven't seen that work. And obviously, if that works, then we wouldn't have an affordability crisis uh, in in downtown Toronto, uh, where we've done incredible amounts of building. Um, but we do, um, and that's that's really because. Um, because the nature of demand, because we have huge amount of demand for housing in this area, because we're attracting so many immigrants, um, because we have uh, so many young people um, that are doubled up with their parents. And so we have all that kind of latent demand uh, sitting there as well. So, um, and it's expensive to build. It's incredibly expensive to build. And so, you know, our old theories of, of filtering down and how housing would filter down as it got older and uh, quality, uh, older in, in time, it would, fill, it would lose its quality and you could um, have it be more affordable. And that works if you have uh, starter homes and subdivisions. But when you're talking about luxury condos, it's really hard to have that filtering down process work. So you have to have deliberate uh, affordability if you want to um, solve solve the crisis. Um, that said, that said, you know, and I, I you know, the, the uh, idea of densification through building three units on a lot is actually a, a bit of a bright spot in all the things that the province has done that that um, are are not really addressing the the crisis. There's there is great potential um, for this idea that we could build three units on a lot. Excellent, thank you. Um, the the theme of today was about you know building housing and kind of planning chaos. And I just wanted we have some. Uh, people here who this is their first time coming to the webinar because, you know, I check names and I'm not creeping anybody, don't worry, but I've gone through the guest list. So we do have some people that haven't been here before. And I was wondering, um, talking to some of the municipal councillors in my region, not everyone fully understands kind of the chaos, the planning chaos that has been created here and what those implications would be for municipalities. So for example, there's one proposal open right now, closing June 5th, uh, councillors, hopefully you're gonna be um, getting your staff to put in some sort of comment about eliminating the growth plan and rewrite the provincial policy statement. Um, this kind of playing, the, the, some of these changes, what would be the implications that municipalities will be feeling specifically so that councillors that aren't haven't been aren't aware of it or haven't been digging into it can kind of say oh this is really actually an important part that we have to be engaged in so Victor can I start with you and some major implications of, of some of these changes yeah there's there's several um, Margaret but I'm just going to touch on a few and one of the things the growth plan did is you know the region's about nine to ten million people now the greater golden horseshoe and it assigned responsibilities to the regions and counties and the few single tiers like hamilton and toronto to actually coordinate planning and development and housing across the region and including the regions which control sewer and water and the government is taking steps to abolish planning at the regional and county levels, including in Simcoe County, 
last fall, and now they're proposing to repeal the growth plan, which sets the framework for a lot of that coordination. And so now we're going to have close to 100 uh, local or lower tier municipalities having to kind of use their best efforts to coordinate with their neighbours in the absence of a county government or a regional government leading the way, particularly when it comes to transportation, uh, rapid transit for those communities that have it, uh, sewer water, and, and for most, social housing, because it's the county and regional governments that actually have responsibility for these housing corporations that you know, provide a lot of the deep need social assistance housing. So that's gonna be a, create even more chaos. Not sure how that's all going to pan out. And just on, on the farmland side of things, one of the big changes that came out just with this new provincial policy statement is the government's proposing that every farm parcel in the province should now be eligible to create three additional lots for residential houses, like non-farm houses. So it's going to introduce um, all sorts of people <laughs> into farm country and there's, there's all sorts of issues with that. And it's really not the place where we should be directing large amounts of new population. Uh, they should be directed to our towns and villages and, and cities. So there's a couple of the big things of note, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And just to to throw in that within our region, I mean, most of the municipalities in our area have a population fewer than 30,000 uh, people. And so when you lose a regional staff or when your staff are required, like, looking for provincial policy to help them, you know, build subdivisions that aren't going to be appealed to make sure they're following the policies, you know, you're starting to have a real kind of pressure on that staff that are very small. Um, and, and that would be, there are probably more in that boat than there are the ones that have their own legal teams and a, and a whole, you know, full built out department of planners. Um, Karen, for you, you know, for those communities that do really want to think about how they do housing for community need and, and protection of nature, that sort of thing, you know, what are the implications for these municipalities to add on to what Victor uh, said? Yeah, well, it, it the, the, we absolutely have to build within our existing boundaries if we want to achieve sustainable land use. And um, building outside of those boundaries is bad from a fiscal point of view, it's bad for a climate point of view. Um, it, it means that, you know, your, your people are driving a lot more, so there's a lot more vehicle kilometers traveled. Um, you're using a huge amount of concrete um, to build uh, out new infrastructure out in, in, in the middle of the farmland, and so that has embodied carbon. Um, so you're uh, at the same time as you're um, you're you know trying to reduce your emissions in Canada to meet the targets by 2030 or 2050, uh, you're going in the wrong direction. So uh, so it's it's really problematic, and it, it doesn't have to be like this. You know, we just need to look to places that have had success in doing infill development, in in making it uh, easy for people to uh, to build on their own lots and to build within our existing footprint where we have infrastructure already. Um, and that's what we need to do here. Yeah, absolutely. And you did a really great segue to one of my questions, um, going a little bit out of order for what I had planned. But you know, you've worked in different jurisdictions and you're seeing a lot of different places take on the affordable housing uh, issue. It's not just related uh -huh. to Ontario. Um, so what are some promising practices that you've kind of uh, seen or that you know of that you would consider solutions that, that could be implemented or provide inspiration for those uh, councils, councillors on the meeting? Oh, sure. Yeah, we can jump to that um, slide. France, if you want to put that up, that is um, slide number three um, that I have. I, I So um, one of the things we've been, uh, and I can come back and talk about one and two later, uh, if, we, if we want to talk about um, just sort of the numbers that we've seen in other places, so we can come back to that. But one of the things we've been doing at the school cities is, is looking across Canada 
to see who's doing a really good job of encouraging infill development. Um, and the best practices are the most promising ones we found because we they haven't really been evaluated. So we just call them promising. Um, they're all in British Columbia. So here's what Victoria is doing. Vic Victoria is a poster child here. Um, has a new zoning bylaw allowing up to six units per lot. Um, we'll, we'll do this bonus. Um, you, you can get four units and then uh, as of right, and then you can get up to six if you'll just make uh, a, an extra unit affordable according to their guidelines. Um, they have templates for corner town house, houses. Um, they have design guidelines and, and secondary suite guidelines that they put um, on online. Um, which, uh, which, which really help you see what you can do. Um, next slide goes to, um, I think, uh, Kelowna. Is that how you say it? So he, Kelowna uh, has been doing um, pre-zoning for uh, higher densities, um, ran a, a design competition, uh, which was really exciting, came up with a bunch of designs like the one shown here for quadplexes, or which are fourplexes basically, um, and then saw 200 built across the city um, uh, based on, on, on some of the winning patterns that had come out of the competition. Um, and now they're doing another a design competition to get uh, other types of plexes um, and designs out there. And if they can get a set of these kind of pre-approved designs, um, That'll make it super easy to get through the zoning approval process, um, and then this is allowing them, of course, to fast track approvals. And so they're they're trying to get things through in in uh, three weeks instead of a year. So that's that's really exciting. And then last side is I think uh, Vancouver was our uh, no Calgary, excuse me, was our Vancouver is a whole other story. So it's pretty good too, but Calgary. Um, this they're also doing uh, super streamlined uh, approvals seven days um, and then we actually really love their website um, they have just a clear kind of process flow they 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 help you understand uh, about legalizing a suite if you have it already um, what you need to do um, they're encouraging um, it's easy to follow um, it just, it makes you want to do these things. And this is exactly how um, in other places um, they've gotten um, thousands of these extra units, additional units built, um, is by making it completely transparent, making it, you know, putting stuff out there at a grade six level. Anybody can read it. Anybody can kind of understand, oh, I can do this. Um, and this is how, uh, you know, in, in California now, 20% of per building permits are for uh, additional dwelling units. Um, and wouldn't it be great if we could get there in, in Ontario too? Yeah, absolutely. And I think some of the pictures that you showed are great because, um, we're kind of in this binary in Ontario. You either go really tall or you you sprawl, right? Um, and there's the, there's this whole other missing middle, as we call it, that can fit into the character of your community that doesn't have to seem so imposing, um, that really does get at those accessory dwelling units and the ADUs, like you were saying, that, that can provide rentals and, and more affordable housing for sure. Victor, do you have anything to add to that? about promising practices that you've seen or know of? Yeah, so there, there's lots of promising practices out there and Karen, those were all excellent. And you know what, the visuals are really important to help citizens um, get an understanding of what stuff's going to look like, even computer simulations. Just building on that, uh, some of the successful examples I've seen have been sort of charrettes with builders and developers and citizens, right? To get everybody sort of rowing in the same direction. And uh, it's a lot to ask for every lower tier in the, the region to do that. But, and that's where the counties and regions played a, a bigger role. But um, some other examples, uh, just before I go there, there's different compartments of housing, right? There's gentle density, like additional units. There's more infill, medium density on main streets. There's a need for more purpose-built rental, affordable purpose-built rental, and even co-ops and nonprofits are another basket. 
And so one could talk about all of these and we've got some information and that we can share with you afterwards, but just on the, the gentle density, because this is a new change the Ford government brought in, Karen mentioned, uh, three units allowed on every lot or parcel, up to three, and it could be a unit in the house, plus a laneway garage, plus a garden suite, or, or any combination of those. And so um, I think one of the things all municipalities need to do today and municipal councillors is to engage their staff and make sure everyone in the corporation is aware of these rule changes because it's allowed as of right, basically. And so it's important to educate the entire staff. It's important to try to reach out to the public and let them know that these uh, um, permissions are now granted. And the website Karen showed, I forget which town that showed you the step-by-step -step how to do it. That's a really good example. And it would be good to um, maybe collaborate with AMO to to set out some best practices so everybody doesn't have to recreate the wheel, right? And, and some of the municipalities and people on this website probably have some good stuff to share as well. So there's a, a couple of additional thoughts. Yeah, no, that's great. We, um, we hosted a, a, a webinar way back when before the municipal election and uh, the president of the Ontario Home Builders Association was on there. And we were talking about gentle density and how we can encourage gentle density and similar to what you both have picked up in your answers was one of the things he said was it would be really great to have plans pre-approved like here's a design for a threeplex here's a design for a laneway suite and, like you know what i mean and here you've got all of the things that we want it and you can pick from these 9 10 12 whatever designs and it just makes it so much easier to go through that than to have to design new every time. So there are some efficiencies there, which would be great at a, at a regional level, <laughs> but, but we don't know what's happening with those. Um, so I think what, what uh, I was alluding to and what you guys spoke to very clearly was that municipalities still have a lot of, there is a, a, a planning chaos and it seems like every other day we've got another bill with another number that throws another wrench into what's happening. And I feel so bad for the planning staff, especially some of these smaller municipalities that are not only having to <laughs> figure out all of the implications, but still processing planning applications and going through the whole process. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, you've mentioned some specific examples, but in Ontario, what are some things that actions municipalities can take that would still increase their power and role that kind of level the playing field here? And we've alluded to them, but but just uh, in more detail, and I guess, Karen, I'll throw that to you first, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. I can get us started. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do think it takes a lot of work to level the playing field. Uh, so, you know, what's easy to do is build on greenfield land. That's what we've, uh, you know, told people for generations. Go out and build in the suburbs, and we're, that's how we're going to grow. And so we're, we're sort of taking that practice um, and 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 uh and eliminating it from the vocabulary and saying no actually now we're building where we've already built we have to build uh on our existing footprints and to, so all of our systems our banks insurance the whole you know mortgage industry it's all set up to support that sprawl that greenfield development and our finance systems our zoning <laughs> systems etc so it's sort of like you know going against the the tide um so what we what we, you have to do as a counselor or you know as municipal staff is you have to put out um the carrots and the incentives that are going to make it super easy to build where you want people to build and you want people to build where there's infrastructure, where there's schools, uh, where there's people, um, and uh, where it will will be make sense fiscally and from a climate perspective. So, what do you do? So, I, a, a number of tools. There's a number of tools that different municipalities have used. Um, simplest. Uh, we already talked about a little bit. Permit streamlining. So, can you reduce reduce requirements? Can you do priority processing of permits uh, for certain targeted areas? Um, can you give counselors a target? Like, you know, hey, you your your um, ward is is your district's right downtown. Uh, we want to make sure that we build a thousand new units in that area and not out on the periphery. So, 
Um, how are you going to help us do that? Um, um, and then get the, get a kind of a team spirit to kind of focus on that area and get hit those targets um, and 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 move fast to do it. Um, there's tool, there fiscal tools that we ought to be using. We ought to be thinking about the property tax, what we can do um, within the with the that's legal in terms of property tax holidays for uh, for folks building and in, on infill land in the core. Um, we have. Um, uh, local improvement charges are one possibility that you know right now we're we're using this program local improvement charges to finance um, green retrofits can we also uh, you know as people are doing energy improvements energy efficiency can we get them to retrofit for another unit um, a secondary suite a basement suite or something like this but you know what the most important thing we can do <laughs> to level the playing field is educate um, and this is how we've seen um, the other cities around the world um, have have uh, have um, ADUs uh, take off. Um, and actually, Franz, if you don't mind popping up that Portland slide um, I had, um, the story of Portland is is super interesting. We did a study. Um, um, uh, right, uh, comparing Portland, Seattle, and Vancouver, and and uh, trying to understand how those places succeeded in accelerating. It's the chart one, number two, um, accelerating their production, and um, it, it, things were very slow. I mean, Portland started in 2000 with just not much be happening at all. That's when they did their first reforms, 1997. And then they gradually relaxed their de design standards. They made it easier. They took away the parking requirements, really key. Um, and then a bunch of educational uh, uh, efforts came into place. They did um, green tours. They took people around to see what sustainable building would look like and what building, uh, you know, a, a, a laneway suite would look like uh, just to get people comfortable with the idea. Um, then they did some fee waivers um, and, um, and relaxed the design standards some more and it, the whole thing really took off. Um, uh, you can take the slide away now too. But the, the other two things that have gone on in different places, um, go to fairs, um, have a table, a booth at the fair um, this summer, get it out there with, um, with the new uh, regulations, with some um, visuals of, of what this could look like and, and you know, explaining the process and helping encourage people uh, to, um, to build. Um, it's going to take a, 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 people have to get comfortable with the idea because what we're really talking about is, is having citizen developers. We're having people densify their own lot, small, so, so the families become the developer so that they can house, uh, you know, grandma or, uh, you know, or the kid when they come back from college or what, what have you. Um, uh, but that's, uh, it, it's a do it yourself kind of, uh, kind of thing. And that's, that's actually what's taken off on the West Coast. Yeah, absolutely. And, you, and I just like how you finish that because I know some of the uh, municipal councilors in our area have said, we don't really have a lot of growth that's coming our way, but they're feeling the pinch of seniors that can't downsize and stay in their communities. They can't get, they, you know, you go from one 4,000 square foot multi-level house to another, and then there's nothing really in between. And so now they're they're moving people out or they're having to look outside and so outside of their their existing community to be able to age in place this this whole idea of age in place is really great if you have the facilities and the housing and the services to go with but i think as we uh look to see around our our municipalities that that's that's not always really possible for them so people always think you know well we're, we don't have many immigrants that move here we don't have that problem well you probably have a lot of seniors or an aging population or kids that are trying to move home or workers who work at your your you know local manufacturing facility or whatever that really do need uh housing that just can't get it because they want that variety for sure and uh before i throw it to you victor what i what you said about portland was really important because, uh, you know, people talk about Amsterdam, you know, it's so bike oriented and, you know, they've always been like that. We're not Amsterdam. We're not Portland. Well, Portland wasn't always Portland and Amsterdam wasn't always Amsterdam. Amsterdam was also very car dependent for a long time. And Portland wasn't always the 
poster child of ADUs, but they made a decision to change, right? And, and so whether you are exactly like Amsterdam or Portland, the one characteristic your municipality can share is that you can make a decision to change and to, to be different in whatever um, incremental way that you can do that. So Victor, what would you like to add to this conversation? Um, I'd, I'd say two things, I think. In terms of level, leveling the playing field, uh, one of the things that is often not clear is what is affordable housing? A lot of people think it's, it's for the deep need and our socially assisted housing, but for 50 years, our definition has been it's, it's to ser serve up to 60% of the population, up to the 60th household income level. So it's really housing for the majority of people when we talk about affordable housing. And so it needs to in include a whole, whole suite of different housing forms and types. And one of the things that we haven't seen a lot of over the last probably 30 years is purpose-built rental apartment buildings where seniors could move into as well. We've seen some luxury buildings and some socially assisted buildings, but I think there's a role for municipalities to urge the provincial and, and probably more the federal government to bring back some sort of affordable purpose-built rental tax credits or a purpose-built rental housing bond. They have a small version of that to really spur that form of development, which you can see in every community in Ontario that was built in the 70s. Uh, and, and I think that would help level the playing field for for people and in terms of getting access to the types of housing more people could afford mm -hmm. and I, th I think it what you what you brought up was the idea of there's there's probably some creative things there's some limitations that we're experiencing with the changes uh, with provincial policy with the the feeling pressure of, of housing and affordability crisis um, so, you know, sometimes crisis creates opportunity and, and allows people to do things differently because, you know, there's limitations that you have to work around. So um, the, the, all of the things you have both have mentioned so far about thinking about housing differently. And Karen, you had said, you know, our whole system is set up for sprawl, our whole system, whether it be the financial, the insurance, whatever else. So it's very clear as we're feeling this affordability crunch, uh, as we know, the climate crisis is still coming. And by the way, uh, one of the former uh, CFOs of a municipality in BC, a, a conversation I had with him, he said, if we were actually going to be financing what municipalities need to do to responsibly prepare for climate, we should be having at least an 8% tax increase every year, year over year for the next 15 years, which I don't think many municipalities would agree with. So they haven't really, uh, there's still a big disconnect there. But anyways, we, we kind of need to think about changing the narrative around housing, especially in this kind of sensationalized, politicized uh, conversation we have right now. So how does this crisis, how does it provide opportunity for municipalities to do things better or differently? Um, and Karen, you had mentioned about education. So can you elaborate a little bit more about how can we, how can we switch this from this is an impending crisis and all is, all is doomed to how do we see the opportunities of where we can go in a, in a better way? Yeah, in general, you know, we talk about um, in, in urban planning a lot, we talk about shifting from a deficit, deficit mentality or deficit thinking to um, a positive case making frame. And so, you know, we, we think it, it, yeah, it, it is a terrible uh, housing crisis. I actually think it's related also to income inequality. Um, and so it's, a, it's an income crisis as well. Um, the loss of the middle class or the hollowing out of the middle class but the the um but the the um but we we ought to be thinking about the assets we have the 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 tremendous assets we have particularly in what the wonderful small and mid-sized cities uh in canada where you do have um you do have space you do have infrastructure 
you have a, a you know wonderful quality of life and it's exactly where gentle density could be inserted without disrupting anything and without creating a high cost and with providing new new rental income for the homeowner and increasing the price of that asset so i mean it, it's kind of a win win um uh, friends, would would you mind putting up my last slide uh, just briefly? I'll talk about some of the things that we've done um, at the School of Cities um, where we've launched a website called affordablemissingmiddle.ca um, and, and there we put a bunch of materials that are meant to go to the ordinary Joe audience. And so I sort of think about my mother or my grandmother and you know what would what would persuade them to build. Um, so you know first of all we we talk about like gentle density, the missing little. We're not talking about putting towers in your neighborhood. Um, we're talking about um, distributed density or also hidden density it's called. Um, often you never know there's a new unit next door. Um, and then in our, we put out a set of videos. So um, one, we have one on the citizen developer, which is talking about basically how uh, you can do uh, your own development uh, at this very small scale. And then we have other videos like this one on Birchcliff, which are focusing on climate. And, you know, this trying to, to talk about how housing affordability and climate adaptation can be linked um and uh we can we can actually have a have a win-win there if we do it if we do it right we can adapt to climate change by having more resilient communities um and at the same time scale up this kind of uh uh you know potential to to build um little housing that is affordable by design um so uh, naturally affordable. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. yeah, sorry, Karen, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, 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 I, I'll, I'll wrap up my rant right there. So. <laughs> well, I like the idea of moving from a deficit mentality and also looking at case studies. And I'll tell you a, a personal one, a friend of mine who lives in, in uh, Simcoe County, her mother was struggling with being able to afford the bills, couldn't find a place to downsize to, was getting too old to take care of her house. Her, my friend's husband lost his job. Um, all of a sudden, they figured out how they could convert their basement to allow the mother to come in. She pays a little bit of rent. All of a sudden, they were thinking they were going to lose their home. And now they have, you know, there's so many things that were solved with, it, it doesn't solve all the world's problems, don't get me wrong, but, but it's a really good way where you've got an elderly woman who now has a safe, nurturing place to live. You have a family that was financially unstable, who now has a little bit of money that, that you know, you're not having to have kids in poverty. You're not having to sell your family home to go where, like, there's just so many benefits to it. So if you can get past the, well, what if they allow college students to move in and they're going to have parties every time? Yes, those are, those are the problem, but there's so many other people that can be helped if we just open up our minds a little bit with the with these ADUs and the citizen developers. So thank you for that. Victor, I'll give you the last word before we switch to um, questions from the audience. If you haven't submitted your question yet, audience, feel free to put it into the chat. Um, Victor, last words about how does this crisis provide opportunity for municipalities to do things differently, better? I think it raises the obligation on them to try as many things as possible to, to try and help everybody with this housing, these housing challenges. And uh, uh, yeah, and just a couple of other things in terms of laying the leveling the playing field and what others are doing. We've seen some municipalities impose vacancy taxes. They put controls on short-term rentals for Airbnbs to ensure the existing units are are used for <laughs> real housing, not for other purposes. And um, even implementing, you know, affordable housing replacement bylaws. So if someone tears one, some affordable units down to build a, a condo, there's an obligation on that developer to replace those units. So there's a lot of practices out there and uh, I agree with Karen, education and awareness raising is central to everyone's role in the in working at this. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's it's more of a this now has to become a team effort, and it's no longer just you know just developers and municipalities on their own that are trying to figure out how to solve this. You can bring in your citizens, your community, your community organizations. Um, it, you know, you, we're going to need a bigger team. Um, okay, so we're turning over to um, the questions from the audience. And Franz, I don't know if you have some questions that you'd like me to pose or to moderate. Sure. Um, been uh, lots of interesting activity on chat, comments, and questions. I'm just going to summarize the ones that I have seen. Uh, Michelle LeBay had a lot of information about uh, the importance of developing home ownership models that uh, provide housing for people uh, with income levels between 35,000 and 80,000. And I'm wondering, given the conversation that uh, we've had about missing middle and, and uh, missing affordable uh, or missing little, um, any thoughts uh, about uh, about creating um, uh, home ownership models for 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 moderately income people in the context of missing middle housing? Uh, maybe this is something that, if I may suggest, Karen might be able to comment on. Yeah. Um, so, so there's so the the it. it it's it's an interesting issue of, of missing middle affordability and because um because you can take this model um and make very expensive um units um and this is what we've seen in in toronto for instance uh where where laneway uh, suites are or dwellings are costing uh, upwards of 600,000 to build and then they're renting at well above uh, moderate income levels um, and and then the land values go up and so you just generally price everybody out of the neighborhood so how do you counter that is the question and so there's a there's a couple a couple tools we have so first of all um, if everybody builds or if you scale up the 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 whole um, approach if you build hundreds and not just three um then the prices come down um so that's what that this is why we've seen you know in in california we're seeing the the um that in in most regions they're renting at about uh, median income or just below um and that's because there's the the market is because they've seen 60,000 of them uh, built um so that that's one way to get affordability is is through scale there's been attempts uh, like you see in the Toronto program the laneway suites program there's been attempts to uh, encourage uh, landlords to rent at uh, below market for to below market tenants um, through uh, giving them a loan and then the the uh, unit becomes deed restricted these have been really challenging actually frankly um, not and there hasn't been a huge amount of take up it turns out that people um, are not excited to build if the unit's going to become deed restricted immediately so um, so one workaround, and, and this is people have found this in many different municipalities, but one workaround that that might be more effective at getting to low and mod income households is to lo make low interest or, or forgivable loans to low and moderate income homeowners. So target the low and moderate income homeowners and help them build a, a unit um, and um, and likely they will rent to people in their family that are also low and moderate income um, or friends. Um, and that can that then uh, provides affordability. Um, so it's a tricky question. I don't think we've completely figured it out yet. Um, Councillor Elgar uh, from Oakville uh, asked about the farm severances that are being proposed by the province in its uh, um, goal to eliminate the growth plan and update the uh, provincial policy statement. Um, uh, I know, Victor, you you have some uh, knowledge on this. Maybe you could just briefly explain what is being proposed by the province regarding farm severances. So through the provincial policy statement, they've introduced a policy that would require 
all municipalities, whether they wanted to or not, to allow up to three, allow for up to three severances, three individual new lots off every farm parcel uh, in Ontario. And some people are out there counting up how many parcels there are, but there's probably several hundreds of thousands of them. And then as someone's mentioned in the chat, now <laughs> the Planning Act also says that one can have three units a house or in a laneway garage or garden suite on every lot. So three new lots times three new, three new units potentially per lot means nine new housing units in the middle of our agricultural area for every farm parcel. It makes no sense whatsoever. The agricultural organizations are completely opposed to it and uh, it's really bad planning. Um, Councillor, I hope I pronounce this properly, Chipoli from Aurelia, um, uh, posed the question, how important is rent gear to income in the context of, I'm assuming, creating affordable housing options for Ontarians? So maybe I'll take a kick at that. The, the private sector builds about 95% of, of all our housing. And so the 5% the that's subsidized by the public sector, including most rent geared to income uh, arrangements, really only addresses those people and households in the deepest need, the lo very lowest uh, income households of the population. And there'll never be enough money to you know, ramp that up, even if we get to 10%. Still 90% of our housing is going to be provided by the market. And so this is where the nonprofits are playing an increasing role, I think. Uh, things like inclusionary zoning, where developers are in stronger markets or making a lot of money, uh, there's obligations being placed on them to include a certain percentage of their units at uh, below market rates. And so the, there are opportunities to do this, but uh, I'll stop there. I don't know if you have anything. Else. Karen, anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I mean, it's just critically important to have rent geared to income and the uh, possibility of renting places that are geared to your income um, and they are scarce and hard to find. And that's that's why we need to use whatever tools we have. And one of the things that we're kind of missing in, in much of the province is a, a real focus on housing preservation, preserving affordable units before the price goes up. Um, and uh, that, you know, and making sure, and, and even taking the opportunity to buy some uh, small apartment buildings or four plexes or eight plexes, um, you know, before, um, before they get, a, before the market buys them and, and renovates and ups the rent to be affordable. Um, so there's, there's lots of opportunity here and public land is another one, of course, that, you know, a lot of our small and mid-sized cities have, have, have land already. That's a great opportunity um, to be, to, to do your own development um, and to ensure that it's affordable in perpetuity. Uh, just two points on that, Franz. Um, what we're seeing increasingly is where municipalities or the province contributes public land to a housing project. They're doing it through long-term leases rather than selling that asset, you know, for, <laughs> forever to a, a private interest. And the other thing you might want to note, some of you on the call, is the province uh, in this Bill 97 and, and some stuff last fall, they're proposing to be able to, res to restrict municipalities' abilities to require the replacement of, of affordable housing in terms of their bylaws. So this is really confusing when the government's trying to promote affordable housing and yet on the other hand, they're trying to restrict what municipalities might do. So in terms of le leveling the playing field, pushing back against that type of Counterintuitive proposal is something I would advocate. 
We've got time for one more question, um, and, and that comes from uh, Councilor Merton in Owen Sound, who asks, uh, can you share some affordable housing bylaws? And maybe I could ask both Victor and Karen um, to suggest uh, municipalities that you know that have really good affordable housing bylaws that uh, those who are interested in uh, that could, could uh, go to to get more information. Karen or Victor, <laughs> any yeah. thoughts? Who, who's doing it I, well? I have a link for to that one that I had referenced in Victoria. So let me just pull up oh, that link great. and I'll put it in the chat. I've not heard of affordable housing bylaws specifically. So um, municipalities usually have a multifaceted approach to affordable housing. They might have a, a, a program, right, about municipal land. Toronto has something called its open door program. You might want to Google and look up. Others rely on these rental housing uh, replacement bylaws. And still others use um, other tools as well, such as inclusionary zoning to require units. So I don't have one in particular or several to recommend, but um, maybe we can see about finding some links and, and you can share them with the broader group afterwards, Franz. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret, for, for a great moderation. Thank you, Victor, and thank you, Karen, for your um, wonderful comments and, uh, and insights. And thanks to all the participants for your comments and questions over the last hour. We will be making this recording available in the coming days. I'll send a link out to everyone who registered. Um, and uh, we're about to wrap up, but before we do so, we have just one more poll question uh, to help us find out what you thought of this event. Margaret, maybe I could ask you just to put up the last poll. Way ahead of you. <laughs> The, the response are coming in fast and furious here. Just waiting for a couple more people if you haven't put in yet. All right, perfect. So there you have. Can you see it? I, I can. Maybe you could just summarize it quickly. Sure, no worries. It's... Uh, 48% very useful, 48% useful. So there we are. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your feedback. Um, uh, if you have any additional comments, um, you can reach me at any time at uh, info at livableontario.ca. Um, and before we conclude, let me just say a, a few brief words about the Municipal Leaders for Stronger Communities in this series. Our hope is that these webinars will build a sense of community and that will help uh, municipal leaders be more effective. And our next webinar uh, is probably going to take place sometime in June. Haven't quite figured out what it is yet, uh, but stay tuned. I will be reaching out to all of you. Uh, finally, a very big thank you to EcoSpark for partnering with us. And once again, thanks again to Margaret, Karen, and Victor. And thanks to all of you for joining us today as we build a stronger community. Um, Margaret, I'll ask you to turn off the recording. And now it's time to move to the after.